Amen. Thank you, Brother Luke. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. That's a great truth in the study that we're in. I'd rather have Jesus as we study a book about all the other stuff life can give. No matter what this world has to offer, I'd rather have Jesus than any of those things. And I hope that that's your uh, life's mantra tonight. And we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. When you find it, if you'll stand with me as we read the scripture together here tonight, Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. We'll <clears throat> go through the whole chapter tonight, uh, but we'll just read the first eight verses together. This, this first part is very familiar, and uh, pray that it'll be a help to us as we look at this here this evening. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. And let's pray. Fathers, we come to you tonight. Help us, Lord, as we look within your word. God, this book is amazing. And I pray as we look within it that we'd see the the grand wisdom, Lord, and and great truths that you have for us as we live in our day-to-day lives. To see a book that was written thousands of years ago through scores of different men over the period of 1,500 years, and yet still in 2023 is applicable to our lives today. We thank you, Lord, for this uh, book that we can study. We thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, this evening as we look within it. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. By way of review, we see Ecclesiastes as the personal account of a man who had everything in the world and yet had nothing. It is the honest report of somebody who got everything in life they wanted and lived to tell the tale. His conclusion, vanity. Where he looked, we see is that statement, under the sun. He searched for the meaning of life, and he sought it, we looked at chapter two, and and projects, and he wanted servants under him, and he gained wealth and and wisdom. You know, Solomon, of course, had, had a thousand wives with his concubines and wives, and you could say from the world's perspective that he had it all, and yet he said, Vanity, emptiness, nothing. So far, last week, verse 17 of chapter 2, he said this, Therefore, I hated life. I hated life. Got to the point where it was so bad, he says, I hate my life. Some people in this world make that decision and maybe take their life. Or they give up on life. Or they decide to do the wrong things in life. And that's a, that's a strong statement. I hated life. That, that, that title of our series, Chasing the Wind, is is what it's like for people who search for fulfillment in the world. It's like chasing the wind, chasing something you're never going to be able to grasp or get, maybe put your finger on. And as we go into the message here tonight, my title is this. It's going to sound like a, like a new evangelical book or something like that, but just stay with me, okay? Best day ever, all right? Have you ever heard your child say, this was the best, this was the greatest day ever Maybe after a vacation or after a time with family or doing something that you enjoy, you've said that before, this was the greatest day of my life. Now, now what causes a a kid to say that? Is it because you went to an amusement park that they've always wanted to go to? Is it because they got their favorite toy maybe on their birthday? Or because they got to play with their friends and, you know, got to get all dirty out in the mud and mom didn't care if it was all over their face and in their fingernails? Is it because you made their favorite food or their ice cream? I know this, it probably wasn't because they did what they want, that that they should have done. It's because they got what they what they wanted, what their flesh desired. Something that was pleasurable, something that was fun. But understand this: that feeling only lasts for a short time. The next day might be school for that child. The next day it's back to bedtime. It's back to brushing your teeth and getting the dirt out of your fingernails and getting back to the routine of life and and how it should be. And I want to ask this question, why can't every day be that way? 
Not why can't every day be amusement park and all the fun and pleasures, but why can't we view life as today is the greatest day that has ever been. It's the greatest day of my life as a Christian. Is that not how we should view every day? Today is a gift from God. Today is special because God allowed me to have life today. There are opportunities that God has presented specifically uniquely for today. Today I got to walk with God and read his word and pray to him. Why can't every day for a Christian be viewed or should be viewed in that way? Today is the best day of my life. I believe this, that God wants to give us a full life. God wants to give you a blessed life. God wants to give you favor in life. My wife, when we were in high school, told me her life verse, Psalm uh, 37, verse 4. It says, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. How many of you have memorized that verse before in school or something like that? It's a popular verse, and I remember when she told me that, I, I thought, first of all, that, that kind of sounds a little selfish. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So that means if I delight in God and I decide, Lord, it, it's my desire to have a, a sports car, or it's my desire to have this much money, it's my desire to have these things. Is that, is that what that verse means? So, so I began to ponder it. And I thought, surely that's not what God is saying. That's not what the Bible is saying. Now that's what you could twist it to say, but that's not really what it's meant to say. I believe in that verse, God gave a divine order in how he words it. He doesn't say, I'll give you the desires of your heart. And by the way, be, be happy with what God does in your life. No, first, delight yourself in the Lord. And the product of that is he will give thee the desires of thine heart. Here's what happens. When you decide, I want what God wants, and I want to please him, I want to bring pleasure, I want to fulfill his will, I want to do God's best in my life. My desire then changes, not to what I want, but to what God wants. In other words, it's like a kid coming to mom and dad saying, oh, I don't want sugar cereal, I, I want my vegetables, and I want to drink water all day, and I want fruit, and I want the good stuff. I want, I want all the things that you're supposed to eat as a parent. You say, that, that's my desire. I desire for you to be healthy and I desire for you to, to, to eat things that will strengthen your body. That, that's an easy thing for a parent to say, well, sure, if you're desiring the right things, I, I want to grant those petitions. And I believe God the same. But understand this, your desires are affected by what you delight in. Delight in the world and you're going to want the things of the world. Delight in things of God, and you're going to want the things of God. The closer you get to know the Lord, the closer you get to realize the things that God wants, the things that God desires, the things that God has planned for your life. And I believe this, that the key to enjoying life fully is getting your heart in tune with the Lord. We, we come to a passage here where Solomon starts to talk about enjoying life. And as a Christian, you have to take this with not a worldview, but with a scripture view. You see, the world can take this passage, and the reason why people in the world love certain verses in the Bible is because you can spin verses to say something that God doesn't intend for it to say. A message that, that isn't there, but, but by first glance, without study, without context, without understanding other passages that you compare to, you could say, well, hey, enjoy life, so let's, let's skip church. Let's put the Bibles to the side. Let's go have fun. Let's go party. Let's go drink. Let's go live it up. Hey, why live for God? Why, why, why live by separation? Let, let's just go live it up. I don't believe that's what God's saying, and I don't think any mature Christian would agree the same as well. So, so what is God trying to teach Solomon here about enjoying the fullness of life? Number one, we see this, and we'll go through the chapter together, that life has its purpose. Life has its purpose. I believe that God has a perfect order to the various seasons of life. We read the, the verses together, <coughs> verses 1 through 8. There's a time for birth and death, planting and plucking, killing and healing, casting away stones and gathering stones, embracing, refraining, getting, losing, tearing, mending, loving, hating, war and peace. In other words, he's saying that all these things will make up your life. All these ingredients will be in your life. But there are some times when it's time to weep. And there are other times where it's time to laugh. There's times where it's time to, to, to sow and 
times where it's time for the harvest. Have you ever been in a, a wrong place, wrong time scenario? Or maybe said something at the wrong time? Or had the wrong attitude? A, a good example of this is children. You might be, be real serious and maybe they did something wrong and, and you're like, you know, all right, we need to talk right now and, and you, you're, you're in trouble and, and here's why. And they, and they start looking at you and they start smiling and snickering and it's like, stop that. <laughs> it's not time to laugh. And the worst part is when they make you start to laugh. <laughs> and I tell them, okay, just because dad's laughing right now doesn't mean that I'm still not going to do what I told you I'm going to do. This is still going to happen, okay? We teach children that there's a time to have fun, and there's a time to sit still. There's a time to be crazy, and then there's a time to, to do your work. There's a time to laugh, a time to eat. So God says here there, that life brings its variety of seasons, and there's a purpose for every different season of life. Can I say tonight that different seasons have different purposes? This is taken from National Geographic. Seasons have an enormous influence on vegetation and plant growth. Winter has cold weather, little daylight, and limited plant growth. In spring, plants sprout, leaves turn unfurl, and flowers blossom. Summer, warmest time of the year, has the most daylight, so plants grow quickly. In autumn, the temperatures drop, and many leaves lose their trees. And so we, we see with plant life and vegetation that the different seasons bring different things to, 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 to the world that surround us. And the different seasons have different purposes. Can I say tonight that in the seasons of life, there are different purposes? In childhood, what's the purpose? Obey your parents. Learn about God. There's purpose in development, physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual. There's a purpose of learning Bible truths. Well, what's the purpose of a teenager? Make it. Make it. Survive. Parents survive, right? B build a meaningful relationship with mom and dad a meaningful relationship, uh, maybe developing a surrendered heart to the Lord, developing a walk with the Lord. Uh, what's the purpose of a young adult? How about to get a great opportunity to serve, especially for those that might be single? I, I was talking to somebody a couple of months ago and said, listen, if you're you know, not to the point yet of marriage and family and whatnot, you might have the greatest time in your life right now, just time-wise, to be able to, to serve. I mean, you're the one someone could call up and, hey, we need help. And Okay, you don't have to consult with anybody. You don't have to maybe ask, you know, hey, what's going on with your schedule? And what? Just because of that season of life, there's a great opportunity to serve, maybe to work, maybe to save. Uh, purpose of a young adult, to strengthen Bible convictions and principles. What's the purpose of a newly married couple? I believe to build a godly home in their marriage and children, to develop their children, to be established in a ministry. What, what's the purpose of the middle age? Uh, maybe to develop young people, to, to invest into their local New Testament church, to serve with, I believe in that stage of life, a great balance of wisdom, but also of physical strength still. How about the, the empty nesters? Maybe to draw closer again to your spouse, or, or to serve in a, in a greater capacity that, that time wouldn't allow beforehand. Maybe to be a strength and a support to your children as they go on with their lives. How, how about to give in a big way with, with less things in your home. Uh, how about for a grandparent, what's the purpose? I believe maybe to stay faithful, uh, to continue to grow together with your spouse, to, to invest into your grandchildren, to be a blessing to your children, to serve in a capacity when you're able to, as you're able, to be a well of wisdom to the younger. H how about those around the finish line in life? Uh, how about to remain faithful, to, to allow others to care for you, to be a joy giver, to give what you can, to speak wisdom into your family. Now, now, these are just small thoughts to the variety of the seasons of life, but all that to say this, every season has its purpose. Every season has its purpose. Just because you're not a teenager anymore doesn't mean you don't have a purpose. Just because you're not maybe in the prime physically in your life doesn't mean you don't have a purpose. Just because you're young maybe as a Christian and not as mature as others doesn't mean you don't have a purpose. Every season of life has a purpose. We find that through verse 8. Verses 9 and 10, we see this, that life is precious. Life is precious. 
So again, we're, we're coming with this thought that, that life is great. Life is awesome. Hey, best day ever. I understand this, that life has a purpose. Whatever season I'm in, there's a purpose to my life. And number two, that life is precious. Life is a gift from the Lord. We see verse number nine. <clears throat> what profit hath he that worketh and that wherein he laboreth? Verse 10. I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Now you'll find throughout Ecclesiastes that there's a time where Solomon gets a little discouraged. He gets a little depressed. Like, we are just on this conveyor belt of life and it's like people come and people die and people work and then it goes away. And man, it's depressing to view life like that. Well, everyone's going to die one day. My life's not going to matter one day. I'm going to be in the ground. What's the point of even living? That's a very depressing way to look at life. But the reality is that life is precious because life, the life that you have, was created by God. Now, you can look at the bleak side of it, but you can understand that life is a gift. Can I say this tonight, that every season of life has this. It has burdens and it has blessings. Not one or the other, but both. In every season, every stage of life, you have good things and you have bad things. You have hard things, you have easy things. You have burdens and you have blessings through every season of life. Some seasons might weigh heavier on the burdens, but the blessings are still there. Some seasons you might say, man, life is just great and God is working and things are fruitful and it's awesome but there's still burdens there, whether they're heavy on your heart at that time or not. Every season of life has both. Eleanor Roosevelt says this, today is a gift, that's why it's called the present. The Bible says, verse first of the Bible, in the beginning, God. Where does everything start? In the beginning, God. Life is precious because life is from God. He's at the beginning and he's the source of the gift. You see, the reason that, that we preach and teach against this you know, movement of transgenderism in our society is that it's founded on the premise that somehow my life was a mistake or that I was born in, in the wrong body or you know, God messed up, God, God did something wrong. It, it's an attack on who God is. It's not viewing life in that, man, I'm so thankful for how I was born, where I was born, how God created me with the, with the skill set, personality, family, the country, the, the environment. I'm thankful for the precious life God gave me, but in turn, it's, well, I, I want something different than what I have. No, no, life is precious. We should be thankful and grateful, overjoyed at the life that God has given. You think of abortion the same. Abortion is around the premise that, that life is maybe just coincidental or, or accidental. It's just, a, it's just a frivolous thing. It's not a precious gift from God. Life is precious. You think about the birth of a child, and I, th I think there's many parents here in this room. And I don't know, I'm sure it hit you like it hit me, especially with our firstborn. When that baby was born and we held him in our arms just to think how, how precious, how miraculous life truly is. Number three, we see this that God's timing is perfect. God's timing is perfect. How, how can we say to ourselves that, that, that life is great? How can we enjoy life? It's when we come to the realization that every season, but also the timing of everything in our lives is perfectly ordained by God. Verse number 11, if you'll read it with me, it says, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. What a statement. He hath made everything. Now you break that down a little bit. He, it's from God. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He's the one who sets it in order. He made. In other words, it's his plan. It's something he's doing. It's not just, well, God's going to see how it works out. No, he is orchestrating the events in your life. And what is he doing? Everything. Every event, every circumstance, every burden, every blessing, every season. He makes everything beautiful. Not just good, not just okay. He says, I'm going to make it all in the end. When you look back, you're going to say, it's beautiful what God did in his time. His timing is impeccable. Now think with me, if you will, to the Old Testament example of Moses. Moses was, of course, uh, had to let go by his mother, Jochebed, who during that time of uh, persecution, if you will, uh, the slaughter from Pharaoh's house and 
Pharaoh, of course, his daughter went down and, and found that little baby crying and had sympathy, had care and compassion for that child, Moses. Brought Moses to be in the, in the uh, Egyptian home. Grew up as, as an Egyptian, first 40 years of his life. As a 40-year-old man, saw one of the Hebrew people being, being you know, abused and whipped and, and mistreated and stood up and said, I can't stand by this anymore. And not to justify what he did, but I believe that was a turning point in his life. He took the life of that man, but that was the moment I think Moses said, I can't stand by and not do anything. I'm not meant to stay in Egypt. I'm not meant to live in Egypt. And I think for Moses, he said, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to work. And God said, why don't you go wait on the backside of a desert for 40 years, and then I'll let you know. And as an 80-year-old man, the Bible says, in the process of time, God heard the cry of the children of, uh, of the Hebrew people in Egypt. And when the king of Egypt died, said, all right, Moses, now I'm ready. Well, 40 years ago, Lord, I said I was ready. And I was ready to go forward. I was ready to serve. I was ready to fight. But that wasn't God's perfect time. You see, God's timing is perfect. Ours isn't. God's timing is impeccable. Ours isn't. <clears throat> and pro there's a process of time for God's plan for Moses, and there's a process of time in God's plan for you. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God just says, mm, not right now. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We tell our kids to wait. I said, wait, just hold on and wait. And you might get frustrated at a child and say, would you just wait a second? But I wonder when God looks down and says, would you just wait? Would you just learn to hold on? Hey, I told you I'll do it all perfect. And I told you it'll be beautiful if you'll <clears throat> trust my time. Wait and be of good courage. And I like this, and he shall strengthen thine heart. What happens when you wait? You have a stronger faith. You have a bigger faith. You believe more that, that God's going to do this. You see, waiting doesn't diminish our faith. It strengthens our faith. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Number four, we see this, that God's work is perpetual. God's work is perpetual. Verses 14 and 15. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it that men should fear before him. I like this statement. Uh, Warren Wearsby said, faith is only as good as the object of faith, and the greatest object of faith is the Lord. He can be trusted. In other words, it's only God that we can truly have faith in, because God's plan, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. It's going to happen whether people in the world get on board or not, it says this, his work is forever. It's established. No man can take from it. No man can alter it. No man can adjust it. It is set in stone. His work is going to be for eternity. You know the great part about this? We see that this grand plan and this grand uh, purpose that God has for your life and mine and for the world, and he says this, come be a part of it. Come join me in this work. You can have an impact in the eternal work of God. He says, I want to enlist, I want to include, I want to impart you in this plan. We see how Rahab's work was connected to the birth of Jesus Christ. Abraham's work was connected to the birth of a nation. David's work was connected to that place of worship and sacrifice for the Jewish people. Paul's work connected to the institution of the church that we still uh, uh, use today. Jesus' work connected to all of mankind for all eternity. That there's an eternal work that God has in his plan. C.S. Lewis said, the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Now we think of our lives today. We think today. Today doesn't seem as big as eternity. But today has a link to eternity. And God's saying, you might not see the link might not understand the connection. You might not see how I'm using what you're doing today, but there's a link between my work today 
if you get on board, if you surrender, if you want to be a part of it in what you do today for eternity. Number five, we see this, that God's judgment is precise. Verse 17 says, I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Again, reminding you of the, of the overall theme of this, of this passage together. That, that we can have joy in the fullness of life. That we can enjoy every part of life that God has given. Knowing that his judgment is precise. I don't know about you, but I look at the world and say, God... How have you not rained down fire and brimstone to America yet? How have you not cast down and brought the, brought the hammer down on the wickedness and sin and evil that is taking place in the world? Now, I believe still that God deals with things, and of course, God's not turning a, a blind eye. God's not, you know, withholding 100%, but, but not certainly to the extent that we deserve, not to the extent that the world deserves. But he says this, that God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For again, there's a time for every purpose and every good work. Many ask, you know, when when is God going to judge the the wickedness in the world? But we got to understand this, that we're not called to be the ones to bring the judgment. We're not called to be the ones to bring the hammer down and, and right all the wrongs in the world. Romans 12, 19 goes on to say, um, if I can get my thing open back up. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord's. In other words, God says, hey, don't worry about all the evil and wickedness in the world. I'm going to take care of it. It's going to be done. It's going to be dealt with. I'm going to do what needs to be done in the time and place that I have ordained. God's judgment is precise. Number six. Death is promised. Death is promised. Now, that truth doesn't make us really go back and say, life is great, life is grand, life is wonderful. But but in verse 20, we see just the the, the reality of it all go into one place. All are of the dust and all turn to dust again. Now, again, this could be viewed from a depressing point of view or or a realistic point of view that we understand that death, it's a reality of life. Hebrews 9, 27, it says, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. You, you don't know when your appointment is, but you know this, one day, I have an appointment. Might be many, many years from now, and that's, that's the hope and desire of every person. But there's also a hope and desire that one day, I'll get to say goodbye to the sins, and the worries, and the cares, and the pain, and the prescriptions, and the doctor visits, and the traffic, and the nonsense of this world. One day, it's all going to be over, he says. All the burdens, all the turmoil, all the pain. And then lastly, number seven, today has its own portion. And this thought kind of encompasses the message here tonight. Today has its own portion, verse 22. So you get through this whole thought, and you go from the, the purpose of the seasons and the different burdens and blessings that it can bring. We understand life has its purpose. Life is precious. In our lives, God's timing is perfect. God's work in our life is perpetual. Today is linked to forever. His judgment of the things that need to be dealt with is precise. Death is promised. And in the reality of this, verse 22, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works. For that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? It's been said this way, we are always in the present, but seldom focused on it. Let me say that again. We are always in the present, but seldom focused on it. Can I say tonight that no matter what season of life you're in, there's always something to complain about. We're we're in fall, we want to be in spring. We're in winter, we want to be in summer. We're in summer, we want to be in winter. If you're too busy, you want to do less. If you aren't busy, you want to do more. If you live in the heat, you want the cold. If you live in the cold, you want the heat. If you work inside, you want to go outside. If you work outside, you want to go inside. Teenagers want to be independent adults, and adults want to be young again and maybe free of all the responsibilities. 
It's like in the Midwest, they say, if you don't like the weather, just wait a little bit and it'll change in a few minutes, right? Every season of life has its variety. No, no, no season of life is exactly the same. And I believe what God is using Solomon to say here is this, is that life is going to have its ups and downs. Life is going to have its burdens and blessings. There's a purpose in every season. Whatever God has you in, if you're following his will, know this, it's God-ordained, it's God's plan, it's God's timing, and today has a link to eternity. And he says this, enjoy today. Enjoy where God has placed you. Enjoy the season of life that you are in today. Don't look back at the past and say, well, if only. Don't look to the future and I can't wait. And yes, we need to have eternity in perspective. But God's given us today. Today is the day that we can rejoice in God. Rejoice in the Lord always, we say. And again, I say what? Rejoice. Can I say today, learn to be content and enjoy the season of life that God has you in. Now, now can, I, can I give kind of a side note with this? Don't, don't take that thought of enjoy my life and throw out every other Bible principle. Don't take that thought, I'm gonna enjoy my life and not consider the future. Don't worry about the future, but we ought to consider the future. Don't take that thought and not consider your testimony. Now, don't worry about what people maybe view and think about your life and to, dictate what you do because of them. But on the other side, we ought to consider our testimony. We ought to consider our reputation. Now, now what do we do with this thought? We enjoy what opportunities God's given to us today. We enjoy the season of life that God has us in today. We appreciate the life that God has given to us. We think on the future, but I can't work in the future. And I can't work to redo the past. What can I do? Live today. Thank God today. Take advantage of any opportunities God brings my way today. So what, what do we do with this knowledge? We enjoy the blessings. We enjoy the opportunities. And we trust God to use the seed that is planted today and to use it for eternity. Here's a man that said, my, my life and how I lived it was a waste. And I thought I was living the dream. But really, the blessings of life is knowing that every season of life has a purpose. No two seasons are going to be the same. And whatever season you're in, there's a purpose for that season of life that you're in right now. Every season has its burden, and every season has its blessing. Not one or the other, but both. One season might be heavy on one and lighter on the other, and vice versa. It might change again tomorrow. But, but life is precious from God. And I pray that as we, as we study this, as we look within this account, if you will, from a man who enjoyed it all and tells us about it, that we can look at our lives and say, Lord, regardless of what they have, regardless of what I used to have, regardless of whatever might be awaiting me tomorrow, I'm just going to decide to be happy in Jesus today. I'm just going to decide to live for God today. I can't live for God yesterday, and I can't live for God tomorrow, so I'm just going to live for God today. I'm going to trust God today. I'm going to enjoy the blessings of life today. Father in heaven, as we come to you this evening, I pray that you'd help us to see the, the responsibility of today. We ask forgiveness for the past. We ask for clarity, maybe even wisdom. We, we hope in the future. We might even pray for the future. We think and dwell on things that are to come, but, it, but it's today that we can use. And Father, may we have that testimony that today is a great day because today is from God. Today is a blessed day because today I get to live for God and somehow use, use the fruit and use the, the seeds that I sow and God will somehow connect it to eternity. That, that God has a purpose. That whatever things need to be dealt with, that in the end, God's got it covered. I don't need to worry about righting every wrong of everything in the world. And I, I have my life to live. I have to, I, have, I have to do right. And I have to do what has been entrusted in, in my care. And Father, to see this, that you give us the, the ability to enjoy our portion. Whatever portion, Lord, of life that each person is in in this room, I pray they'd see that. That we have the opportunity to live in the fullness of joy in Jesus Christ today.